Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our session on AI for mental health. I am Zoe Kurzi, and I'm delighted to be joined today by our speakers and representatives from mental health uh, charities. We today have with us Ruby Wax, a well-known and true ambassador for mental health, Dr. Andy Blackwell, Chief Science and Strategy Officer at Aisha Digital Health, Professor Miranda Wolper, Director of Mental Health at the Wellcome Trust, Sarah Sheno, Head of Research at NQ, and Dr. Federica Marinaro, Research Informatics Engagement Manager at Alzheimer's Research UK. Together, we will be discussing the challenges of mental health and brain health across the lifespan and how AI can help provide innovative solutions towards personalized diagnosis and treatments. Without further ado, I would like to introduce our first speaker, Ruby Wax. Ruby is a writer, performer, and Chancellor of University of Southampton, and a visiting professor in the School of Mental Health Nursing at the University of Surrey. But most importantly, Ruby is a mental health advocate, and in 2015, she was awarded an OBE for in her incredible services to mental health. Ruby became a patron for the British Neuroscience Association and brought mental health issues to the foreground in Parliament through her work at the Home Office to raise money for neuroscience research. Amongst other charity work, Ruby also became an ambassador for Mind and Sane, has held open sessions for sufferers and set up dedicated social networking communities for mental health. She performed her first show, Losing It, based on her experiences of clinical depression in a number of institutions and charities and has become a leading speaker on mental health issues. Ruby supports us today in our initiative to use AI and data science to improve mental health research and services. Ruby, thank you for joining us to offer your perspective on mental health as a societal priority. Thank you. Thanks for having me. So about um, 15 years ago, I became <clears throat> poster girl for mental illness, which was a surprise to me because I'd never told anyone that I had something. Uh, I, I never told anybody I had an issue because, uh, of course, I was afraid of being fired. I was working at the BBC and, uh, you know, it just wasn't acceptable. I mean, even in my lifetime, way back, you couldn't mention you were gay. And then a while back later, you couldn't mention the C word, cancer, not COVID. And then way back, you couldn't even admit you were a witch. But now mental health seems to be the latest taboo, but those are changing. Anyway, I didn't have to be afraid of uh, being caught out because shortly after that, I, I quit television. My last interview was with Donald Trump and I wanted to scrape together what was uh, left of my mind. And uh, I left. I, I went on to study neuroscience. So that was me trying to scrape it together. But um, what happened coincidentally at the time when I was quitting is that Comic Relief, you know, uh, we're raising money from some mental health charities. So they asked if they could take a photo of me. So I said, yeah, sure. But I thought it was going to be a tiny, tiny photo. But without asking me, they put giant, giant posters of me all the way up and down the tube station in every tube station and said on it, one in four people have mental illness. No, it's, it gets worse. One in four people have mental illness. One in five people have dandruff. I have both. So I looked, I was just, I was mortified. So I thought, oh my, you can imagine. I thought I'm going to pretend, I'm going to pretend I'm opening in the West End and that this is my publicity poster. So, uh, so I thought I got away with it. I had to write a show. I didn't have a show about mental illness. So I wrote one, uh, but I didn't really want to perform it in front of people. So this is serious. For the next two years, I performed in mental institutions up and down the UK, and I think they loved it. They weren't always facing me, but uh, I used to say that the bipolars would, my reviews from the bipolars was, I laughed, I cried. <laughs> but I love them. They're my people. Then we'd have a little interval after I did my show. They'd go off to get their meds, whatever. Then they'd come back in and we'd have question and answer. And they asked unbelievable questions. If you want to know what they were, you could ask me later. But unbelievable. What happened was the show suddenly took off and it went to real theaters. I don't remember the 
how that happened. But now I was performing in New Zealand, Australia, uh, South Africa, America, Edinburgh, Europe. The show went everywhere. And um, now they couldn't fire me because it was my show. <laughs> and when you're on stage, nobody can touch you. Uh, so what happened was I could stand on stage. I could talk about my mental illness because if you can make people laugh, all is forgiven. So I could talk about it and be paid, which is unbelievable. And on top of it, I got an OBE. <laughs> so I guess it worked out, but um, I'm not saying you should try it. But anyway, what I did was I stood on stage. I explained that my depression had nothing to do, which I think is important, about feeling depressed or sad or anxious. This is all on the human palate. It, it feels, I know you went forward, would know that one day your old personality is gone and you've been replaced by a block of cement. It's as if the sun has been eclipsed and it's never coming back. I mean, I used to sit and stare at the shower for five months thinking it was incomprehensible to ever get up and get over there. So, you know, nothing matters to you at that point, really, because you've left town. I mean, whether you uh, get a manicure or jump off a cliff, it's the same thing. So finally, when I was institutionalized, which had to happen, um, I used to, uh, I got very few, got very few cards or flowers. I mean, if, if I had been with child or I had a broken leg, I would have been inundated. But all I got was a couple phone calls telling me to perk up. Mm -hmm. No, perk up, because I didn't think of that. But you know, one thing you do get with this disease is a real sense of shame. That comes with the package. Because, um, you know, people would say to me, would say, uh, you know, I know people with real diseases. So what if you got, show me a lump, show me an x-ray. And of course, there's nothing to show. So even I started thinking I was making it up. And then the more shame you feel, the worse the illness gets. And I was beating myself up thinking, oh my God, well, I'm not being carpet bombed, but I don't live in a refugee camp. Who am I to say that I'm suffering? So you get even more shame. So then you don't just have, you know, a one, one little thought, you know, that self-abusive critical thought that usually lives with me. But now I had about 100,000 critical voices uh, shouting at me all at once. So it was like if the devil had Tourette's, that's what it would sound like. But one of the most rewarding things about doing the show was that uh, after I did my show, the audience would go out for the interval, just like in the mental institutions, then they would come back and we'd have question and answer. And um, I, I don't know why, but maybe because I took my mental clothes off, then they felt safe enough to take theirs off. So for the last 15 years, I did different shows, but the audience always start to stand up and now more and more uh, and say their story. You know, and sometimes these are thousand seaters. So these brave little souls stand up and say, oh, you know, I haven't left my house in 20 years. This is my first time out, or I jumped off a bridge. It didn't work. You know, and they can feel that everybody cares and everybody's listening. It's so liberating. And of course, if you haven't got an illness and a mother stands up and says, I don't know what to do, my daughter's cutting, and some woman up in the balcony will say, so is mine. And then they'd meet after the show. Was, um, or a student would say they're burning out from exams and another student and they would meet. And eventually, I'll just go quickly, when uh, I got the show to London, I opened the uh, theater doors during the day and invited the public to come, come in off the street. Um, and I invited Peter Fonagy and Luce Walport and Mark Williams and they would do talks to the public. And then I invited therapists to come and you could really feel, and I would serve coffee and cookies, that was my job. And you could really feel the stigma starting to slow down, you know, because I think in the real world, people, or maybe it's changed, I don't know, people think that having a mental problem is a lightweight thing, that you can think your way out of it, clearly because you thought your way into it. Like you got up one morning, you thought, oh, what should I do? Should I take up golf or have depression? See, they don't realize, and you do, you're all educated, you don't they don't realize that physical and mental are the same thing. It's the same thing. Mind, body, body, mind, it's a onesie. You know that. So that when, you know, there's too much cortisol, you know, whatever, there's that amygdala explosion, that it works its way down, this, that toxicity, it works its way down like a pinball machine, taking you out organ by organ until eventually you've broken your immune system. And we all know we need that. And then, of course, it's no longer mental. Now you're open to many diseases, uh, diabetes two, cancer, uh, certain cancers, premature aging, infertility, obesity, uh, loss of memory. 
See, then it is physical and then it really is serious. Okay, then it's taken seriously because you can't think your way out of something physical. And all the research money is thrown at those diseases for possible cures. And, and my, my question was always, um, had some research money been thrown at the mothership, the brain, we could have maybe nipped some of those physical diseases in the bud, but who am I? So, um, well, on that, let me just say, uh, some, throughout the years, there have been audience members that have stood up and said, you know, I have cancer, but I, or I had cancer, but I also had uh, depression. And I always say, which one do you think is worse? Every time they say uh, the depression. You know, with the cancer, they get sympathy cards because they're wearing the headscarf. And with depression, they found themselves out of a job. So just to finish, I had my biggest depression about 17 years ago. Uh, yeah, 17 years ago. And I wanted to know if there was maybe a way I could figure out how to, um, obviously there's no miracle cure, but I could maybe see it coming before it came down the pipe uh, because forewarning is everything. So I researched and uh, at the time I found out scientific journals, I, I became obsessed and it seemed mindfulness, which sounded way too vegetarian. I never heard of that. And cognitive behavioral therapy had very good results for depression, ADHD, OCD, um, panic disorders, high anxiety, just the generally frazzled. So I found out who was one of the uh, creators of mindfulness-based cognitive therapy. They had put the two together and he was a professor at Oxford. So I drove straight to Oxford. I'm very driven, which is good for the career, but pretty bad for mental health. So I found him and I said, um, just tell me what goes on in the brain if you practice any of this stuff, because I haven't got time, you know, and don't throw me an angel card what goes on in the meat, okay? And he said, well, if you want to find out, you'd have to get into Oxford and get your master's. And so I did, and nobody was as surprised as that man. But, uh, you know, I, it does deliver what it says on the tin without going into it too much. I really, um, of course, everybody wants a top tip. It isn't a top tip. It's that through practice and practice, I can actually sense when my... Uh, when a depression is in the early stages. You know, it's like when you see an animal and it listens to an, and it hears an earthquake coming, that's a little bit of how I sense. I can feel the early swells because the thoughts start to change. Their accent changes, their tone changes. My hair, I can notice, even starts to get depressed. And then of course, the eyes go dead. Um, that's what parents and teachers and workers should look at. If the worker or your kid has dead eyes, watch out. If they look sad, you're still okay. But, you know, I could feel it coming. And then the last few times when I got the early warning, I shut off social media. I didn't speak to people. I didn't throw a thousand dinner parties for people I've never met because those of us with depression, we like to show the world we're fine. And then of course we even go, it goes deeper. So the last few times I checked into a, a retreat and I stayed quiet and as agonizing as that demon is, it passed after five days rather than the usual five months. But um, let me just say, mindfulness is like doing Iron Man of the brain. It takes practice and discipline, and a lot of people don't want to do that. But I always thought, what should come next? This has always been my fantasy, is that somebody builds some kind of tech for, for those of us who cannot don't have access to how to read what's going on in our mind. It would be the mental um, answer to Fitbit, which in my opinion, kills you faster than almost anything. You know, always nagging you, oh, today you uh, ran up the Himalayas, not good enough, tomorrow swim the Amazon. It's like having my mother nagging me on my wrist. So my dream is that someday there would be this mental Fitbit. We would, it would be a bespoke model and it would indicate when we're going near our tipping point because we can't we're always trying to keep up with the next guy that's part of our illness you know that we're somehow not biodegradable but it would give us a gentle little nudge that if we kept going the way we're going we would either go toward a heart attack or maybe a dip into depression and then we would have tools to cool our engines okay this is what mindfulness does but we need something to help us read ourselves why we're not taught that at a young age, I don't know, because maybe we're too busy. We have to get into university. We're too busy to look in and see what's actually running the show here. You know, cognitively, no question, we're brilliant, but emotionally, we're still in the dark ages. It's like our brain, it's like we have a Ferrari on top of our heads, but nobody gave, it the, <laughs> nobody gave us the keys. 
So if we're going to survive in the future, I think we're going to have to start to upgrade our minds as much as we've upgraded our iPhones. You know, humans always depended on tech. That's how we survive. Animals, you know, they have claws and teeth and venom. We have nothing but a brain. So for to defend ourselves, we made spears and then missiles and whatever to communicate to a wider audience, a printing press, a television, computers. And now we need tech to help us find our minds and stay human, which is the perfect time for me to introduce the next speaker, Dr. Andy Blackwell. He's a PhD scientist and health healthcare technical entrepreneur. He's a group chief science and strategy officer at E, excuse me, at IE, so Digital Health, one of the largest providers of online mental health care in the UK. IE, so Digital Health is a multi-award winning provider of evidence-based talking therapy for mood and anxiety problems and has pioneered the application of technologies such as deep learning to improve quality of mental health care. Andy is gonna speak about how we might use the data in our health systems to develop more effective treatments, which is exactly what I've always dreamt of. So Andy, to you. Oh, well, thank you so much, Ruby. It's absolutely fantastic. Um, it's, um, it's an incredibly, brave thing uh, to reach out uh, for help when you're experiencing uh, symptoms of, of, of mood or anxiety conditions as, 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 as Ruby, Ruby has so eloquently uh, described. And, and when someone does uh, reach out for help, we have these um, really important moments of opportunity and, and, and of course responsibility to ensure that we give people the best possible advice and, and if necessary, um, a treatment. And, in, in those moments, uh, people should uh, reasonably expect that they'll be um, given um, uh, timely access to treatments. No one should have to wait. Often they've been waiting a long time before, uh, before seeking help. Um, they should expect also that their problems will be uh, properly understood and, and if helpful, uh, receive a, a diagnosis that's, that's accurate. Um, of, the, of the many thousands of clinicians that may potentially be available to someone uh, in those moments, uh, they might expect to be connected with the person that's uh, most likely to be able to help them and to help them uh, get well. And they should also expect to, be, uh, to, be, to have the right treatment recommended. And, and most commonly that in, 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 in uh, depression and anxiety disorders would be a medicine or uh, a form of uh, talking therapy, such as mindfulness-based cognitive therapy, as, as, as Ruby's described. And of course, those treatments should be uh, delivered at the right dose. Uh, people need to get enough uh, such that they can uh, benefit, but, but not so much um, that it's unnecessarily uh, burdensome uh, to, to, to those people in those very difficult times. And of course, it must do what it says on the tin, as Ruby has said, and, and include some active ingredients that are evidence-based. Um, and if all of those things go well, that, that they should expect a, an enduring benefit of that interaction. But uh, unfortunately, uh, more, more than we would like, um, that is not what happens for everyone in, in, in mental health care. People have these long journeys of, of trial and uh, error uh, before they find something that works uh, for them. But I think uh, we have uh, an unprecedented opportunity to uh, really put technology to work and artificial intelligence uh, to take the trial and error out of those critical moments in a person's um, life and, and to get things right uh, on the first uh, attempt. Uh, nearly every other industry uses previous data on uh, decisions, actions and outcomes uh, to learn and to improve in, uh, in really fast uh, cycles. Our sat-nav systems, uh, powered by machine learning, are able to use the data from all drivers on, on, on a similar journey to help each driver avoid the traffic and to optimise their uh, journey times. So my question is, can we apply those same AI enabled learning systems and embed them within our mental health care system so that uh, we can use the collective experience of all 
uh, patients in treatment and all clinicians uh, to help each person um, find the right treatment and the right treatment journey uh, first time. I think we can, uh, but there are some things that we need to do in order to make that a, um, a reality. Now, that it won't be a surprise to anybody attending an Alan Turing Institute uh, session that we need lots and lots of data capturing those uh, decision actions and uh, outcomes so that we can learn. Right now, um, if a thousand clinicians were presented with precisely the same person seeking help with all the same symptoms, each of them would likely take a slightly different approach in the way that they recommend and deliver treatment. And some of these approaches will have better outcomes than uh, others. And whilst we used to think about that as a source of unhelpful variability and, um, and noise in, 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 in mental health care, we're starting to think of it as perhaps our best possible opportunity uh, to learn what works and to progress, um, uh, to progress quickly. Whereas um, in conventional uh, care, where things are face to face in a room with the door closed, um, we had uh, very little opportunity to learn about those actions and outcomes and what seems to be working and, and so on. Now that the world is moving towards telehealth care, that's remote uh, treatment, where the a computer is sort of intermediating the relationship between a patient and a, a clinician, we have a new opportunity in a privacy maintaining and highly secure way uh, to see what treatment is being delivered and uh, the effect that it um, uh, that it has. And since the the, the, the COVID uh, pandemic, almost all uh, talking therapy for mental health has been virtualized. So we have a new opportunity uh, to access this uh, very precious uh, uh, data. But having uh, very access to very large data sets by itself is, um, isn't very helpful. What we really need are uh, mechanisms to make sense of those data and make them useful to us. Um, and one of the previously very difficult or perhaps intractable challenges has been that most of the information about someone's mental health or their response to treatment is encapsulated in the form of conversation and human uh, language. And uh, language is uh, much harder to turn into structured numerical data than say uh, the SNPs in someone's genome or uh, an analysis of blood chemistry. Um, so we've been working uh, hard to develop new AI driven uh, tools that allow rigorous uh, quantitative analysis of um, mental health uh, data. And I've, I've shown here a very colorful uh, barcode um, and what this represents is an hour, a single hour of therapy that's been analyzed using um, a, a, a TensorFlow based deep learning uh, system. Each little colored bar represents a language event or an event that's occurring during that therapy session. So um, in, in this particular session, you can see that there are eight minutes of um, language events that are, that are non-therapy therapy related, these little green bars, that's chit chat that happens at the start of a session. Uh, there's then 25 minutes of pink uh, bars, and, and that's when the deep learning system is detecting evidence-based therapy techniques that are applied in the session. And then there's about, the rest of the session is a mix of chit chat and some therapy and some administrative procedures and so on. So you can see immediately that when we have the data in this form, we can suddenly start to be able to interrogate those data to find out what's happening in therapy, and also to try and associate those events with the subsequent uh, relief of symptoms. Uh, what is it that needs to happen in therapy in order for people uh, to get well in, in the soonest possible uh, time? Um, so as we uh, start to get um, a much uh, better handle on what really matters in treatment using these systems, uh, we can start to incorporate this knowledge into clinical decision support systems. And this is where the rubber uh, hits the road um, that can be used to arm clinicians with uh, insights born out of the collective experience of all the therapists and all of the patients going through uh, care. So again, 
uh, each person can benefit from the experience of, of every person uh, in, in the system. And we're just at the start of this, this, really, this phase. It's really difficult to develop these systems and design them uh, well. And at the moment, we can check that the basic active ingredients of therapy are taking place. So, so people know that they're getting high quality uh, care. In the future, we hope that they'll be much more adaptive so that um, they can offer sort of turn by turn uh, guidance during treatment, even when things are very, uh, very complex uh, in, 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 indeed as they, as they often are. Um, we've used multiple computational approaches uh, uh, such as that, and, um, and we're really starting to see very significant progress. Uh, on the right hand side of this slide, I've shown the improving outcomes or clinical recovery rates in depression and generalized anxiety disorder, which is where we've been concentrating. This is in around 80,000 people. And year after year, our outcome rates have been improving uh, systematically. And the more data that we're able to uh, study, uh, the more we can learn and the better these outcomes become. Uh, so this is in a relatively small sample for healthcare at large, but uh, we're excited to understand what might be possible when we embed these systems in, in, in much bigger uh, health, health systems. So uh, we have data um, and, 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 and quite large data sets. And I think um, we've only really started to scratch the surface about what might be possible with machine learning and, 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 uh, and, 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 and other computational techniques. So we've generated some very large uh, data sets. I think these can be applied in the next grand challenges in mental health. And I think early detection and prevention, getting better targeted and more effective uh, treatments, particularly language-based treatments, and using technology to automate some clinical processes uh, so more people can so we sort of extend the reach of the therapy community uh, and, 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 and sort of superpower clinicians um, as best um, uh, we can. So if you are um, an AI scientist and you think you might be able to help us uh, use these data to drive forward progress in, in mental health care, we'd love to hear from you. We're very keen um, uh, to, to collaborate. Um, I just want to thank my, my colleagues. There's some amazing people working on, on these problems in, in, in Cambridge. Um, uh, and, and, but I'll conclude by saying, um, I think now more than ever, uh, data and, and, and artificial intelligence have such an important role to play in, in helping people live lives that are unhindered um, uh, by mental health um, uh, issues. And, um, and what could be a more important application of AI uh, than, than, than that? So thank you very much for your attention. Um, I'm going to hand the mic to uh, Zoe um, and, and, and uh, introduce, uh, introduce Zoe. So I, I will stop sharing. And um, so Zoe is a professor of computational cognitive uh, neuroscience in the Department of Psychology in Cambridge. Um, her research aims to develop predictive models of neurodegenerative disease and uh, mental health. Uh, Zoe uh, received a PhD from Rutgers University. Uh, she then went to MIT and Harvard, to the Max Planck Institute, um, and then to University of Birmingham, and, and latterly uh, uh, here in Cambridge. So it's um, uh, fantastic to introduce uh, Zoe, and she's going to talk to us about machine learning for predictive uh, prognostic trajectories in dementia. Over to you, uh, Zoe. Thank you very much. Uh, wonderful talk so far. I will try to go a little bit faster so we have plenty of time for discussion. Um, so uh, a little bit of uh, uh, shifting gears, uh, uh, moving from what we heard uh, about depression, and anxiety related disorders uh, to neurodegenerative disease, uh, which uh, is not without its challenges and hopefully we are making progress by using uh, AI guided uh, tools. Uh, so I, I'll just uh, uh, focus on uh, the example of dementia um, and uh, the impact of this uh, in our societies. Globally, 50 million people live with dementia and health and social care costs are estimated to be 26 billion in the UK alone. Predicting early onset of neurodegenerative uh, uh, decline has major implications for timely clinical management, but also for patient outcomes. Yet we still uh, lack tools for stratifying patients into subgroups for which tailored and effective uh, treatments can be developed. So in this space, um, the major challenges we are facing um, relate to comorbidities. As we heard about uh, depression and anxiety, 
Uh, this is definitely something that patients with neurodegenerative disease experience, uh, and potentially they might be suffering uh, from mental health uh, disorders uh, rather than dementia pathology. How can we tell this apart is a major challenge. Usually we have sparse and complete and unlabeled clinical data. Uh, we have uh, non-sensitive screening tools. Uh, and uh, when we look at biomarkers, the tools we have are uh, highly uh, invasive and expensive. Uh, so um, to uh, give a specific example, the, the example of Alzheimer's disease, what we see is that actually we deal here with a continuum uh, from cognitive health uh, all the way uh, to dementia. Uh, and it's only later uh, in this continuum uh, that we see symptoms. But if we want to diagnose uh, very early for patients to benefit uh, from treatments and interventions, um, uh, we need uh, uh, tools uh, that uh, can target potential uh, early uh, development of symptoms. Uh, currently, only very invasive uh, tools like uh, PET scans and lumbar punctures uh, can tell us uh, early on about potential markers of disease. As a result, we end up misclassifying and misdiagnosing patients. Um, we are looking at separating uh, healthy patients from uh, patients at early stages of mild cognitive impairment with a huge gray area uh, of patients that fall in a stable uh, category uh, that might or might not um, uh, uh, develop later on uh, dementia. Uh, so um, our effort here uh, is to develop innovative uh, AI guided solutions for early precise uh, diagnosis, uh, for uh, patient stratification uh, and uh, for personalized uh, interventions. Uh, and all of that uh, to be able to deliver it uh, very early on with low cost and non-invasive uh, measures. So briefly, I'd like to give you an example of uh, um, how we can actually uh, uh, succeed in this. Uh, and, and this is some work that we've been doing uh, with my team, um, uh, looking at developing what we call predictive and prognostic machines. Uh, it's a, it's um, a, a solution based uh, on uh, AI algorithms or machine learning uh, tools uh, that look on to uh, first extracting features from data, then classifying uh, patients, uh, and then delivering a trajectory modeling approach that looks at each individual uh, and uh, uh, its potential for uh, remaining stable in terms of brain health uh, or uh, deteriorating. Uh, and, and very brief, briefly, I'll just run you through uh, our tools and results. What you see here is by using uh, regression models we can extract from brain scans, from baseline uh, brain scans. This is a five minute a structural scan, uh, uh, will give us enough information uh, to predict cognition uh, from um, uh, uh, just um, uh, gray matter uh, on the brain. And then we can input this together with other data in machine learning models that allow us uh, to uh, identify prototypes. So we can build a prototype through our machine learning, uh, metric learning models that relates to a uh, stable, healthy uh, condition uh, versus uh, uh, disease decline. Um, and uh, looking at these models, we can uh, integrate a lot of data. So these models have the capacity uh, to look at different data from different modalities and therefore harness the power of this data and learn the interactive relationships, uh, learn really the multivariate information that lives in this data. And you see that we can do this by using biomarker data like APOE4, beta amyloid, uh, or we can simply use uh, scores in cognitive tests. Now, uh, we can then use these uh, models to classify patients into healthy versus uh, mild cognitive impairment versus declining patients towards uh, Alzheimer's disease. Uh, but we can also move away from these binary classifications to a more individualized approach. These models allow us to extract metrics uh, that tell us how far each patient is from a stable, healthy prototype. 
uh, by computing this distance in a way and how fast the patient is moving away from health, uh, we can generate individual uh, trajectories that can be more accurate uh, and reduce misdiagnosis. And that's what you see here. Uh, uh, this um, uh, trajectory index that we generate from the machine learning models uh, allow us to uh, see uh, how quickly patients uh, are declining. Um, and uh, we can do this, obviously we validate this on completely uh, separate data. We have done this work and looking at cohorts uh, across different uh, countries, uh, the UK, the US uh, and, and Singapore through collaborations. Uh, but most importantly also, we need to validate these uh, indices, these model driven uh, scores against biomarker data. And what you see here is uh, these uh, prognostic scores that we extract from our models relate very closely to biomarkers like uh, beta amyloid, uh, atrophy in medial temporal cortex and APOE4. Uh, finally, these models have the capacity to allow us to reclassify patients. What you see here is um, uh, data from uh, ADNI, a large uh, cohort uh, that we use for training the models. And you can see that if we uh, look at these scores, at these prognostic scores that are derived from the models, we can reclassify the patients, each individual patient, uh, of whether they remain stable in their cognition or they start declining. Uh, and really interestingly, we can then take data that is not used in training the models and uh, actually come from pre-symptomatic cohorts. These are individuals that do not show uh, any symptoms that they are healthy. And you see from the spread, we can determine whether these individuals will remain healthy uh, or whether they will start declining. And this can happen very early on before they have symptoms from simple baseline uh, data. So uh, quickly to summarize, um, uh, I hope I've given you um, uh, some, some hope uh, that with machine learning, we can build solutions uh, that allow us to look at individuals, uh, build disease trajectories, reduce the risk for uh, misclassification uh, in, and improve patient stratification for uh, uh, clinical trials and, and drug uh, discovery. Uh, finally, I'd like uh, to mention that uh, uh, all of this work falls uh, within a new initiative that is uh, uh, funded and spearheaded by Alzheimer's Research UK. Uh, this is the Early Detection of Neurogenerative Diseases Initiative, uh, EDEN, and EDEN moves beyond uh, uh, the research that I presented in uh, actually looking for digital technology in the same um, uh, way that uh, Andy was talking uh, about digital technology um, helping us with diagnosis. Uh, of uh, depression. Uh, in this case, it's used for diagnosis uh, of dementia. Uh, and uh, Eden is putting together uh, digital tools um, that will measure active and passive cognition, neural activity, and physiological measures non-invasively uh, and uh, 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 with the aim to detect symptoms uh, much earlier, 10 to 15 years earlier, uh, before uh, symptoms uh, occur. I'll close here. Federica uh, from Alzheimer's Research UK will be talking to us more about uh, this exciting initiative. I'd like to uh, thank uh, all our colleagues and collaborators and funders for making this work uh, possible. Uh, and now I will uh, stop sharing. Uh, and, and without any delay, I'd like to use uh, the rest of our time uh, in inviting uh, all our speakers and uh, our panel members uh, from the charities. Uh, uh, for a discussion. Uh, so uh, we have uh, Andy and Ruby that you already heard from. We also have Miranda Wolpert from The Welcome, uh, Federica Marinaro from uh, Alzheimer's Research UK, and, and Sarah Sheno uh, from NQ. Uh, and I, I would like to give you uh, the opportunity to tell us a bit about uh, how your uh, respective trusts uh, see the future of uh, AI in mental health. Um, Sarah, you are first on my screen. Would you like to start? Let me unmute, um, of course. So um, if you haven't come across MQ, we're a mental health research charity. We've been um, around eight or nine years or so. We're UK based, but we're global in, in what we do. Um, and so, so the, your question was about the biggest challenges in mental health. I think uh, 
there are three that come to mind in particular. COVID has shone a spotlight on mental health um, issues. And we've had conversations around the new tsunami, the next pandemic of mental health. And actually, I think that's not really accurate because mental health problems already existed and they were already at endemic levels. They've just become worse. So some of the, the recent data from the um, Mental Health of Children and Young People's surveys shown that in, in, in primary school age children, um, the prevalence of a diagnosable mental health problem has gone from one in uh, one in 10 in 2014 to one in eight in 2017 to one in six last year. And that's astonishing. So there's a, we've got this backdrop of massively increasing mental health problems anyway. Um, that's the problem because we don't have the workforce to, to deliver the kind of therapy that's, that's needed at scale. Um, I think that the second one I'd highlight, Ruby very eloquently put earlier, which is the intersection between um, mind and body and mental health and physical health. I loved that phrase, mind, body, body, mind, it's a onesie. It absolutely is. Um, and we know that people with severe mental health problems die on average 20 years earlier than their unaffected peers. And that's largely due to physical health problems happening at a, at a greater rate and being um, being missed. Um, and so one of the things that MQ is doing in that regard is, is to try and overcome some of the silos that have traditionally existed um, across the board, but particularly in terms of the mental health and physical health divide. Um, so with, with Welcome, we've been um, talking for a while now about this umbrella discipline of mental health science that gathers people from the full range of disciplines um, to together tackle the same problems. Um, really importantly, people with lived experience need to be in the middle of that. Ruby's demonstrated so eloquently how important it is to listen to their insights. Um, one other thing we're doing is having a very challenge focused approach um, and bearing in mind the mental health goals we've now got um, and the, our approach at MQ of developing challenge focused roadmaps that then guide what we do um, and, and what others in the sector go on to do. Um, I'll hand over to Miranda for some more challenges. Thank you, Sarah. Miranda. Thank you very much. So um, uh, yes, we work very closely with MQ and others. Uh, I am from the Wellcome Trust, and for those who don't know about the Wellcome Trust, we're a very big biomedical research funder. And very excitingly, as of the end of last year, we have announced that mental health will be one of the only three things that we will focus on as targeted urgent health challenges, along with infectious diseases and the impact of global warming on health. So we're the first very large scale research funder to have mental health up there as one of our absolute key priorities. And that goes alongside our ongoing commitment to a wide uh, open discovery science, uh, open calls that include any form of science, uh, not limited by those three health challenges. And um, so I'm very hoping that all of you will be applying for a whole range of things around um, uh, AI and uh, neuroscience in the world coming forward, both through targeted calls and non-targeted calls. From the point of view of um, uh, where we see the challenges and opportunities, I think it very much chimes with what the speakers have already said. So Ruby's very impressive personal experience of, of your own um, learning about what works for you in a way that at the cornerstone of what we're trying to do at Wellcome. So we put people who are experts by experience, their own lived experience, our co-workers with us, their paid colleagues with us in the uh, endeavour that we're trying to achieve. And we're trying to... Um, look at what the active ingredients are for what will help different people in different contexts at different times and understand that better. Uh, one of our contentions is we've been limited up till now by three things. We've been limited by silos between different research communities. So neuroscientists not talking to psychiatrists, not talking to economists, not talking to historians, not talking to uh, psychologists. And we need to bring those silos together and we need to sort of share learning with data science, absolutely being key to that. And I'll say a bit more about that. We've been limited by the populations we've looked at. So we've been very focused on what we call the weird countries, the Western industrialized, educated, rich and democratic countries. And we've missed out on huge parts of the world where there is huge diversity, which we have not captured in terms of our research agenda. And moreover, within those weird contexts, we've been very focused on those small minority people who access treatment. So the work that Andy is doing is absolutely inspirational and really important. And in addition, we want that expanded to non-clinical populations. The vast majority of people with mental health problems, whether severe or, or less severe, do not access mental health services. Many of them find ways through and with, and we need to 
learn from those as well as from clinical services. So at the moment, we have two interventions, which are talking therapies and um, medications. They haven't really improved the efficacy for many years, despite the fantastic work that Andy's doing, which is starting to improve some of the efficacy. But we need to expand our vision of what we look at and the questions we ask. And I guess that leads to the third expansion and limitation we've had up till now is that we've been we've looked at quite narrow data sets. So we've looked at clinical data sets um, and health records. We need to expand to much larger population data sets and we need all the force of AI and data science there. We need to find new ways of engaging commercial holders of data and academic holders of data and population cohorts. And we need to find new models by which the people who are banking their data and sharing their data have greater ownership so that we can balance privacy with open science. So that's our agenda and we're really interested in working with anyone who's interested in working with us on that. Fantastic, thank you very much, Miranda. Uh, Federica, how about ARUK? Thank you, thank you very much. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I'm actually glad to, to talk as last because I can see that we are all very much in line with the efforts we want to put, you know, with our with the activities of our charities. In particular, you know, in, in Alzheimer Research UK, uh, we work mainly, you know, on different types of dementias, but we also keep in mind the fact that uh, almost half of the people that suffer of different types of dementia, they will also suffer... Um, of, for example, depression and mental health problems. So, you know, the, the, the comorbidities and the connection between these different words is, is very much uh, on, on our radar and is very well known in, you know, in research. So I would like to answer to Zoe's um, question about challenges, but also how we are trying to overcome this and look at AI uh, and type of intervention we are trying to, to plan. So Basically, I think what, what is important to say about Alzheimer Research UK is that we have three main challenges that are really important for us in terms of mental health and focusing on dementias in our case. One is for sure, you know, as a, a charity that funds research, uh, we want to make it sure that research has the, um, the right fundings to be able to, to run all the studies that, that are needed. We, we try to make it sure that also innovation is very much, you know, at the front line of, of uh, having the right exposure and opportunities. And also we want to connect internationally our researchers and the community. So in these, uh, we do all this with the idea that this will contribute surely to the future treatments that will be one day available to fight these bad diseases, but also a real focus and challenge also for our summer research UK is to make the society aware about what is mental health, uh, the impact on society, but also about how this can represent also a risk to, for, for dementia. We know that some people, uh, you know, many studies show that in early or late life, uh, uh, depression has an impact on how you will have more or less, um, let's say you will have a higher risk to develop dementia. So we need to make it sure that society knows about that. And Alzheimer Research UK does a lot of work in reaching out to society um, by delivering this type of information. And the last challenge that will help me now to, to talk about uh, the Eden project that Zoe uh, just, um, just uh, talked about before uh, is about the fact that we know a challenge is uh, related to diagnosis. Of course, our focus is on dementia, but the connection with mental health problems that I just uh, mentioned before stresses how it is important to recognize these things early and well. Uh, this connects also to what Andrew and Zoe just said before. Uh, and what we want to do is to make it sure that uh, we can intervene early in a way that not only we can um, look at possible intervention, but we can also um, suggest people how they can change their lifestyle on time to make it sure that if they will suffer of dementia, this will happen, happen much later than what it, it, it would be. And this is where uh, Alzheimer's research case started having uh, this very uh, beautiful, I think, international uh, project, which is called EDON, uh, that works on the early detection of um, neurodegenerative diseases. Uh, the aim is to have um, an integrated toolkit uh, that is using uh, the advantage that uh, artificial intelligence gives in terms of uh, training and creating models for uh, identifying uh, population or part of the population at high risk of dementia. But this shifted much earlier than what we can do now. So like 10, 15 years before what we can do now and the use of, for example, we are looking at wearables such as smartwatches or the use of phones, apps, 
uh, will also allow to have measures in a not invasive way, which also will have a strong impact on you know, the mental health of the people uh, that will um, uh, participate to, to this work. And uh, yeah, the final aim would be to have this embedded into the uh, health system and the um, uh, health checks. So the, the, the project exists for one year now, so we are really at the beginning, but we are putting together the effort of many scientists and many realities around the world. So hopefully we will have an enough heterogeneous view uh, of the problem and contribution. So yeah, I'm happy to discuss further. <laughs> Great, wonderful. Thank you, Federica, and thank you all uh, for these really interesting uh, perspectives. It's wonderful to see everything uh, coming together. Um, we have some fascinating questions from the audience, really burning, but we only have very little time, so I'll try and go fast. So please um, give uh, brief answers. Uh, the first question we have is, how effective can AI-based mental health interventions and treatments be uh, while they are still challenges uh, over diversity in AI data and design. And I think, Sarah, maybe you said you'd be happy to take a, a, a give a quick answer to this. Yeah, happy to. So um, it's a huge issue, diversity. I, if, and I think the um, AI actually offers an enormous amount of potential here that other research methodologies um, struggle with even more. So you'll, you'll probably know that as soon as um, somebody is asked to consent into a research project, the diversity rates just drop off. Um, so the use of routinely collected administrative data has enormous potential to unpick some of the challenges around diversity and representativeness in our, in our research data. Bearing in mind that the people who people who come from backgrounds of greater ethnicity, ethnic diversity and lower socioeconomic status are those at most risk. So it's really important that we develop methodologies around that. One of the challenges that goes with that is accessing routinely collected data in an ethical way that has people's trust. Um, there's a whole host of interesting work we're doing in, about that, which I'm happy to have comments on uh, separately if, if people wish. Um, it's, it's hugely important that people's preferences are right at the middle and also that we overstep some of the barriers that, to access that have happened since GDPR was introduced, which has led to such a massive drop off of um, people being able to, researchers being able to access data. Um, I'm really looking forward to Ben Gordek's review in that regard. Um, and yeah, I'll, I'll hand over to somebody else because you wanted to do question three, I think. Um, yes, if there's anything else, I'll, I'll move on to another question. Uh, so the question we have is, how might tech-based solutions help those who don't want to admit they have a mental health problem or maybe don't know they have a problem? Quite a challenge. Um, Andy? Goodness, uh, I got that one. Um, uh, um, yeah, uh, so... Uh, no, no, it's fine. I, I think, so there's... Um, most people wait, uh, say for, with, with depression, there are data to suggest that people wait seven to 10 years before seeking help. And, um, and I think there are tremendous, uh, there's now evidence to suggest that the, the signs of um, an incipient uh, depression, uh, and as, as you've spoken about with dementia, happen some several years earlier. So I think there's a possibility of uh, detecting those patterns and potentially um, we, we know somebody's trajectory and maybe we can offer them some alternatives uh, to those trajectories so that perhaps um, uh, we can avoid chronicity and severity uh, later on. Um, so I, I think um, there are all sorts of challenges around agency and design uh, that we really need to work hard together to, to solve for uh, so that people feel that they're choosing um, you know you know that it's at their election that they might do something that that um, that, that helps their long-term uh, mental health. Um, uh, so, so yes, I would I would say I think I, I think um, um, I think perhaps helping people to understand um, w whether what they're experiencing is is normal and whether there's something that they could do to um, uh, do, 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 do 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 this to their benefit um, might be a great opportunity for technology. But there's lots of complex things we need to solve to make that a possibility. Right. Thank you very much, Andy. Um, I think we can only have one more last question. Um, uh, uh, so do you think human contact is necessary, is the question? Or could an AI delivering CBT help, at least for people who can recognize the signs? Um, wondering whether maybe Ruby? 
you'd like to take this one? To say the question again, sorry. Do you think human contact is necessary for uh, yeah. an AI delivering CBT help? Well, th this is a, uh, I'll try to answer as quickly as I can. We, I, I run something called Frazzle Cafe, which is online and it's, uh, you know, an, a, a, a place where people can speak from the heart. And I'll tell you, there's more human contact, I think, which surprises everybody on the screen because now we're not being distracted by anything because we're on it. And you see people starting to read other people, this mentalization happening the way it never did in real life. I mean, I, I think there's such hope for it uh, because you know everybody was complaining about technology and then now look what it's given us. So I think everything is possible. And look, we don't have a choice. There aren't enough therapists. There aren't enough people teaching. Uh, you know, uh, how many one-to-one -one courses could ever be available? So let's put that right out. It's not possible anymore. So we need to find the next solution. Great, thank you, Ruby. Uh, anybody else? I'm afraid we are running out of time. Any other uh, final comments, thoughts? Um, please uh, jump in. Just a very quick one. I think there's a, for physical health problems, we measure, we routinely measure things like BMI and um, alcohol consumption. Everybody likes that one, but it's measured in every contact that you have with medical professionals. Um, we don't do that for mental health. There's a huge question over the right way of doing that. And I know Miranda and her team are doing some brilliant work around common data elements that we should be measuring, but we don't have an equivalent the equivalent question or set of questions that are routinely asked in all clinical contexts about how someone's doing in their mental health. Um, and if we did that, arguably that would lead to a substantial increase in people receiving help earlier on when they first need it before their problems become chronic. chronic. Issues around it, but would be a really powerful innovation. Wonderful, thank you very much, Sarah. Uh, I'm afraid we have run of, uh, out of time. Uh, thank you for really fascinating uh, talks and contributions. Uh, it's uh, wonderful uh, to have you on board and uh, thank you to everybody from uh, the Alan Turing Institute for organizing. Uh, please do send us uh, more questions uh, if you're interested uh, and uh, stay safe and see you all soon. Thanks again, bye.